I can state flatly that heavier than air flying machines are impossible. Lord Kelvin. Yes, that Kelvin. The scientist that the Kelvin scale of temperature is named after. Kelvin accurately identified the coldest temperature in the universe, absolute zero, the point at which matter just stops moving. He was an inventor, inventing a form of electric telegraph and was even actually given a knighthood by Queen Victoria for his work on the transatlantic telegraph project. Lord Kelvin even became a lord, given the title of Baron for his work on thermodynamics. All of this is to say that as president of the Royal Society, one of Britain's great scientific bodies, Lord Kelvin was the kind of guy you listened to on matters of science, engineering and well, flight. And Lord Kelvin was confident. It was impossible. Heavier than air flight is no easy task. Unlike a balloon, heavier than air flight requires something to keep the craft working, even though it should kind of, well, fall. Even a glider, though cool, doesn't really get the kind of achievement we want here. Gliders are famously, in the words of Woody from Toy Story, That wasn't flying! That was falling with style! Heavier than air, aeroplanes require an engine or some force to keep them going, and another mechanism to steer them. Birds do it, of course, so it's possible, and many attempts had tried exactly that style, and all of them failed. Some spectacularly. And so, looking at the failures, looking at the science, at the maths and the probabilities, Kelvin was confident. When invited to join the Royal Aeronautical Society in 1896, he said no. He had no faith in aeronavigation or of any expectation of good results from any of the trials we hear of. A few years later, in 1902, he was even clearer. No aeroplane will ever be practically successful. But, as you know, he was wrong. Very, very wrong. What you might not know is how soon he was wrong. It was just one year later, in 1903, that the Wright brothers would succeed with the first controlled and sustained flight of a heavier-than-air aeroplane. And today, it's even clearer than that. There were, in 2019, 38 million flights in a single year, meaning there were roughly around 104,000 flights every single day. Kelvin wasn't just wrong, he was incredibly, absurdly wrong. But Kelvin wasn't alone. In 1888, Professor Joseph Leconte, a geologist and eventual president of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, listed multiple reasons flying machines were out of the question for humans. All of this leads him to confidently and rhetorically ask, is it not demonstrated that a true flying machine, self-raising, self-sustaining, self-propelling, is physically impossible? In 1902, a year before the Wright brothers made their flight, the astronomer and mathematician Simon Newcomb stated, flight by machines heavier than air is unpractical and insignificant, if not utterly impossible. A couple of years previously, in 1900, Newcomb had argued that heavier than air human flight would require the discovery of some new metal or of some new force. Only a few years later, the Wright brothers would fly in an airplane made of wood, canvas, and an engine built by hand. It wasn't just the impossibility of flight that major experts were wrong on either, but also whether aeroplanes would be the successful version of heavier than air human flight. Thomas Edison, yes, that Edison, stated, It is apparent to me that the possibilities of the aeroplane, which two or three years ago were thought to hold the solution to the flying machine problem, have been exhausted, and that we must turn elsewhere. Even those that believed flight might theoretically be possible before the Wright brothers flew didn't think it would be done within their lifetimes. In 1900, the president of the British Society of Engineers, William Warby Beaumont, stated that the present generation will not fly in the next century and no practical engineer would devote himself to the problem. Luckily for all of us, practical engineers did devote themselves to it anyway. Finally, and famously, on the 9th October 1903, the New York Times wrote that flight might be possible in from 1 million to 10 million years time. To put that in perspective, humans, as in Homo sapiens, have only been a species for around 300,000 years. 
The hominy family, the far, far back evolutionary root of humans today, split from the ancestors of gorillas around 6 million years ago and from the ancestors of orangutans around 8 to 9 million years ago. The New York Times thought human flight would take at minimum more than three times as long to achieve as the entire history of the human race and perhaps longer than the evolutionary history of hominids. Instead, it took just two more months. Turns out we didn't have to wait one to ten million years. This video is not to shame these people. I mean, they're all dead by this point, so that probably wouldn't really achieve much anyway. But it's to make a point. Expert opinion that human ingenuity cannot solve a problem should not be taken as the final word. No matter how established and no matter how confidently asserted. But serious attention given by serious people to serious problems has led us, time and time again, to incredible achievements. As the science fiction author Arthur C. Clarke wrote as the first of his three laws, when a distinguished but elderly scientist states that something is possible, he is almost certainly right. When he states that something is impossible, he is very probably wrong. When Albert Einstein stated in 1934 that there was not the slightest indication that nuclear energy will ever be obtainable, he was wrong. When Ernst Rutherford said in 1933, anyone who expects a source of power from the transformation of these atoms is talking moonshine, he was wrong. When Robert Millikan said in 1928 that utilizing atomic energy when our coal has run out is a completely unscientific utopian dream, he was wrong. When William Leahy, Fleet Admiral of the United States, told President Truman that a nuclear bomb would never go off, and I speak as an expert on explosives, he was, unfortunately, incredibly wrong. When Malthus calculated that rising human populations would mean that the Earth couldn't sustain enough people to continue climbing population growth without mass starvation, he too was very, very wrong. This isn't to say that every kind of crazy scheme is going to work out. Heavier than air human flight took a long line of people working in aggregate, and some of these plans, nearly all of them, were bad, some ill thought through, and some just like ridiculous. But in aggregate, building up piece by piece, human flight required sacrifice and threat, as well as dedicated attention from serious people ready to reflect on their findings, refine, and crucially, retry anyway. Even when others thought it was insane. Even when Lord Kelvin confidently concluded it was impossible. Even when Edison said an aeroplane would never work. Flight was first achieved by the Wright brothers, but it required the work of so many others to become real. And every attempt before them was, of course, a failure. Some of which could never have worked. They were truly impossible. But as Arthur C. Clarke's second law states, the only way of discovering the limits of the possible is to venture a little way past them into the impossible. Not satisfied with their awful record on predicting flight, the New York Times wrote in 1920 that Robert Goddard's continued failed attempts to build a rocket prove that Professor Goddard does not know the relation of action to reaction and of the need to have something better than a vacuum against which to react. To say that would be absurd. Of course, he only seems to lack the knowledge ladled out daily in high schools. Newton's laws wouldn't allow a rocket to work in space. A rocket in space would have nothing to push itself against. Spaceflight was, therefore, impossible, at least with a rocket. In 1944, the launch of a German V-2 proved Goddard correct. But it would take until the Apollo mission to the moon, July 17, 1969, for the New York Times to issue a correction. It is now definitely established that a rocket can function in a vacuum as well as in an atmosphere. The Times regrets the error. Robert Goddard understood that setbacks weren't failures, but valuable negative information. And he kept building his rockets and improving them incrementally, bit by bit. He was ultimately proven right. All his failures, used by others to show the impossibility of what he was attempting, were, indeed, valuable negative information. How not to do something and how to improve. Flight 
Something we see every day in the sky above us that we used to travel, sometimes incredibly cheaply, from one city or one country to another, was once thought impossible. And thought impossible by some of the greatest minds to have ever lived. It is easy to forget just how astounding these achievements are, how monumental their success. Goddard's response to the New York Times article captures this pretty clearly. He responded defiantly to their ridicule, stating, Every vision is a joke until the first man accomplishes it. Once realised, it becomes commonplace. So commonplace, we can forget just how impressive human ingenuity really is. If there's a problem, we should bet on ourselves to fix it, and we should help ourselves to do it. That's the miracle of human ingenuity, and our struggle against the impossible. Thanks for watching In Pursuit of Progress. I'm Dr. Lawrence Newport. If you enjoyed this, please like and subscribe. Thanks.